the Lord impressed this on my heart strongly this past week for this service and so I would like to direct your attention to the book of Colossians chapter 1 and while you're turning there I want to say also that it's good to have my wife with me this year also my good brother-in-law I don't know why the sound seems to be fading in and out can you all hear me okay I can't hear myself I've been standing in front of those guitars and I have permanent hearing damage did someone say something about I don't know I couldn't hear what anybody was saying but uh, so you all just kind of wave your hand every now and then I'll know that you're still awake and aware tonight but Colossians chapter 1 and I'm going to read beginning with verse number 12 the Bible says giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet or take I'm not fading in and now it needs a new battery Lord showed me it needs a new battery And I want to get this fixed now because I was preaching somewhere where they had a bad batch of batteries and they changed it three times. And they have never let me forget the time that I wore out three batteries in one message. Something back there, right? UQ engine. But it's still doing it. Praise God. Let's start over. Verse 12, giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things and by him all things consist. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. I want to just talk to you for a little while tonight about the preeminence of Christ the preeminence of Christ. Is it okay to talk about Christ here tonight? If you're holding your Bibles, could you lift one hand at least and let's praise him, ask him to have his way one more time. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we need you tonight. Help me, God. Would you grant me your anointing and your unction? Help me to faithfully represent your will tonight. Move in this place, I pray. Hallelujah. Grant anointing and unction to your word. Help every man, woman, young person, and child that's here. Child of God, visitor, Lord, whoever it might be. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. God bless you. You may be seated. Without any preamble tonight, I would just like to talk to you about... A sovereign and a potentate whose equal the world has never known he actually made an appearance on this earth for a brief period of time but his greatness and importance was largely overlooked uh, by the princes and the magistrates of this world perhaps because of the humbleness of his 
arrival as a tiny baby laying in a manger or perhaps because of his uh, simplicity of his lifestyle they only knew him as the carpenter's son or perhaps as the young rabbi from Nazareth who did some amazing things but they really did not understand who he was and what he was but we know that he was much more than that he was no ordinary man the Bible here says tells us his identity that he was the image of the invisible God as such he was not a reflection of God he was not a duplication of God he wasn't an envoy or even just a messenger of God. He was not a likeness as a son would be. You would say uh, of a son, he looks like his father. He resembles his father. But he was not uh, a likeness as a son resembling his father. He was not a representation as you would see on a coin or in a painting or on a stamp but the invisible God becoming visible. John chapter 1 verse 18, the Bible says, No man hath seen God at any time. In verse number 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word was God. And verse number 14, The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten of the father hebrews chapter 1 verse number 3 calls him the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person the bible here said in verse number uh, 15 that he is the image of the invisible god the firstborn from every of every creature that's a strange statement. How could he be the firstborn of every creature when he makes his appearance several thousand years into the human story? In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 20, the Bible makes it clear that he was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but he has been made manifest in these last times. He existed already in the mind of God before that there was anything that we know of today. In Revelations chapter 13 and verse 8 it says that he was the lamb slain from before the foundation of the world. I'm here to tell you tonight that Jesus Christ was not an implementation and he was not an emergency measure that God enacted to resolve a crisis but he existed in the mind of God before there was any other man before there was any other creature before there was any other thing regarding Adam the Bible says in Genesis chapter 5 verse 1 that he was in the likeness of God made he him he was made in the likeness of God how can he be made in the likeness of God if God is invisible if God had no form if God had no shape he was made in the image of God because Jesus Christ already existed in the mind of God so that Adam was created to resemble the prototype Adam may have been the first actual human being but he was made in the likeness of Jesus Christ who already existed in God's mind thus he could be he could still be the firstborn of every creature Amen. I read that the Gnostics in Colossae uh, at the time that Paul wrote this epistle, they believed that the great gulf between God and man was bridged by angels. But we know that in fact it was Jesus Christ who bridged the great gap between God and man because he was fully God and he was fully man. He was God manifested in the flesh. Is it okay to brag about Jesus here tonight? Is it okay to talk about him? 
I want you to consider with me the scope of his power. The Bible here says, by him were all things created. By who? By Jesus Christ were all things created. Again, John chapter 1, amen, when it said, and the word was God, all things were made by him. He is the author and the creator, creator of all things. He was before all things. Therefore, he was not a part of them he was begotten he was not created all things uh, were made by him he is accepted then from everything that was created and that's why he could say amen in the burning bush on the back side of the desert when Moses said when I get over there and they ask me who is it that sent me what am I going to say what answer am I going to give and the answer was I am that I am. You tell them I am sent you because that is eternality. I've always existed. I've always been. I always will be. Oh, hallelujah. I might as well go ahead and insert this right here too. He went on to say, and this is my memorial to all generations, and this is my name unto all generations. How could that be the name uh, uh, to all generations? Because whenever that revelation was imparted to the Jews, they began to refer to him as Jehovah, which means the he is, the he is. And little by little, he began to reveal and unfold just what he was. I am Jehovah Rapha. I am Jehovah Sidkenu. I am Jehovah this and Jehovah that. I'm the one that heals you. I'm the one that delivers you. I'm your banner. Amen. And on and on and on. Oh, but then there was an angel that stepped down out of heaven into the chamber of a, of a virgin girl and said, you're going to call his name Jesus, which means Jehovah, the great I am, has become our salvation. This is my memorial unto all generations. Give him a hand clap of praise tonight. Amen. All dimensions of creation were made by him. Listen to the extent of it. It says here, all, all things in heaven and in earth. Everything you see on this earth, he made it. Everything in heaven, he made it. He's the one that scattered the stars across the universe, that measures them with a span, that, uh, that inhabits all of eternity. He made everything in the heavens. All the celestial bodies were made by him. All the terrestrial bodies and substance was made by him. Listen to the variety of it. The Bible says visible and invisible because there is a parallel spiritual invisible world that exists alongside this one. You'd be surprised at how many other uh, uh, entities are in this room tonight if your spiritual eyes could be opened. There is a whole world of spirit beings, and, and he is the creator of everything that is visible and invisible, and also the orders of all things, and thrones and dominions, and, as well as principalities and powers. All ranks of authority have been made by him. And the Bible says by him and for him. He is both the cause of creation and he is the end of creation. He is before all things and by him all things consist. That means he is the sustainer of everything that he has made. Whether it is substance or composition or layers or patterns or orders down to the smallest molecules and atoms and particles that make up creation. He is the glue that holds it all together. He is the glue that holds it all together. 
fact, let me say this. Jesus said, before one jot and one tittle would fail from my word, heaven and earth would pass away. You know why? Because it's the word that holds it all together. If you can prove God to be a liar on any one point, you pull the thread that unravels all of the fabric of creation. The reason why everything exists as it is today is because he is the one that is sustaining it and holding it together. The reason the sun shines, the reason the stars shine, the reason everything exists, he's the father of lights. He is the generator of all things. Their continued existence depends on him, the intricate balance of nature, and the complexity of ecology. All depends on him. Praise the Lord. He is also a part of history, but he is not a product of history. He's not merely an event or figure that appeared in history. He is the author of history. It is his story that is unfolding. Can you just bear with me here a little while tonight? Amen. He is not reacting to history. He is proactive. He's the one pulling the strings and pushing the buttons. God is not convening any council in heaven right now wondering what he's going to do about current events and, and how he's going to respond to the Republicans and the Democrats and the terrorists or anything else. I read in my Bible in chapter, in the, in the book of Hebrews where it says, amen, yet once more will I shake heaven and the earth because I want to find out what's going to still be standing when I get through shaking we like to give the devil a lot of credit but I'm telling you God's the one that's moving everything and shaking everything because he is the author of history he's not reacting to it he's writing it he did not randomly appear in history but when the fullness of time was come, he appeared on exactly the right date, at the right time, in the right period of time. He didn't wait till all the stars were lined up. He didn't wait till the circumstances were favorable. He didn't wait till everybody was ready. Amen. He, he came as a root out of the dry ground. Praise the Lord. But he appeared at exactly the right time. He could inspire prophets to predict events many hundreds of years ahead and know that they would come to pass exactly as he had declared and is still happening today and is still going to happen. And that's why we're singing about his coming and that's why we're singing about heaven and that's why we're singing about eternity because we already know if he fulfilled his word in all these other events, he's going to fulfill this also. And I'm just going to drop it in here right now. The trumpet of the Lord is going to sound. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. The scoffers are saying in the last days, nothing's changed. Everything's going on just like it ever has. And so they're going on with their worldly, sensual, and earthly living. But it's still going to happen just like he said. Because he is writing history. And it's not over until he writes the end. His arrival was so significant that it split time in two. And time is still measured today as B.C. and A.D. That's how important his arrival on this earth was. And the events surrounding his life. Amen. His power and his authority is absolute. He has no limits nor boundaries. He controls all past, even present, and future. Simultaneously. Time is a bubble in the plan of God. But he's God past, 
and God present and God future. And so that's why we can say about Jesus, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Even time is controlled by him. He transcends all types of matter, all order, amen, all kingdoms and realms and dimensions answer to him. He commands an army of millions of angels, any one of which has unbelievable power. One of his angels stepped into a camp of 185,000 of the enemy and those great men of war never woke up to see the light of another day. Angels bow before him. Heaven and earth adores him. What a mighty God we serve. But the devil, but demons, but principalities and powers, but this, but that. And John looks up and he sees a wide array of angels and he said there were 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. A conservative estimate places that number at over 100 million strong. Yes, one-third of heaven's angels rebelled against God, but that means that two-thirds are still on our side. Come on here tonight. I said two-thirds are on our side. Oh, we marvel at the power and the might and the strength of the militaries of today. I saw where the president uh, was there at the christening or the commissioning of a brand new uh, aircraft carrier a week or so ago. And it's the largest and the most powerful ever built, uh, the Gerald R. Ford. And I was listening to some of the commission, and I was listening as one of the generals was speaking. And he said, you know, one of the presidents, I forget which one it was, said, speak softly and carry a big stick. And he said, Mr. President, I offer you today a big stick. That aircraft carrier was a big stick. But you know what? The army that God commands doesn't need aircraft carriers, doesn't need supersonic jets, doesn't need missiles, doesn't need that kind of firepower. He speaks and he commands. And all power in heaven and earth is subjective unto him. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise, would you? He inhabits an infinite universe and calls the billions of stars by name. By name. His control and reach is unlimited. He himself cannot be measured or defined by any conventional means, any system, any device, or any words of vocabulary fall way short of being able to define and describe and measure him so immense and so vast and so powerful is he that's why the bible said amen that he should have the preeminence that's why he is preeminent and preeminent means first in order or rank there is no higher position above him there's no other power above him to appeal to he's not a little boy sitting beside the big throne he is the preeminent he is supreme he is paramount and he is foremost. He is unmatched 
He is uh, surpassing, unsurpassing, and he is transcendent. He is one of a kind. He is uh, inimitable. He is ultimate. He is unsurpassed. He is predominant, and he is marvelous. And Isaiah said his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. And in his own words to John on the Isle of Patmos, he said, I am Alpha and I am Omega. I'm the beginning and I'm the ending. I'm the one which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. He is omnipotent. He has all power. He is omniscient. He knows all things. He is omnipresent. He is everywhere at one time. I'm talking about Jesus, who is preeminent today. He is a sovereign without equal or peer, whose power has never been effectively challenged. The devil tried it one time. He thought he was big stuff. I'm going to be like the Most High. I'm going to put my throne above the heavens. And I'm going to be somebody. And God said, you're going to be brought down to hell. And Jesus said, I saw Satan as lightning. It was no match. It was no contest. It was no struggle. Down you go. To hell you go. And he has a name that is above every name. And at the name of Jesus, every knee is going to bow. And every tongue is going to confess. Somebody shout his name tonight. Somebody praise his name tonight. Come on, worship him. And we could go on and on. But my question to you tonight is, where could such a sovereign be consulted? Where could he be found? If he has such uh, immense power, if his reach is so unlimited, if he's the creator of all things, if he controls all things, if all things consist by him, if he's the one that made everything, then surely he can fix everything. Then surely he can remedy everything. Surely then illness and infirmity is no match for him. Surely then our problems and our dilemmas and our challenges are no problem to him. Surely then whatever's troubling you will not trouble him. Surely then whatever's going wrong in your life, he can fix. He has the power, he has the ability, and he has the authority. Where on earth then would the headquarters be of such a monarch? Could you reach it by land? Could you reach it by air or sea? Amen. If you came to appeal to him, what process would one have to go through to have a personal audience with such a mighty sovereign? How many levels of authority would you have to appeal upward to? How many ranks uh, would you have to go through? And what chain of command would you have to uh, navigate your way through to finally get through to him? So mighty, so powerful, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen. What process would you have to go through? Amen. Surely uh, the queue line of those waiting to see him would stretch as long as the Great Wall of China. Amen. For just a few minutes of audience and consultation with such a great king, maybe you would not even live long enough to ever bring your petition before him. Maybe you would never survive long enough to have your case 
and your problem heard because there would be so many ahead of you and so many situations far more important and far more pressing and far more grave than your situation. Maybe you would give up after a number of years out of sheer frustration and just wore out from the effort of waiting your turn to appear to such a mighty, a mighty king and sovereign. Amen. How, how, would it, how difficult would it be today just to go have a few minutes uh, with President Trump? Whether you like him or don't like him, voted for him or didn't vote for him, doesn't make any difference. He's still the President of the United States. And anybody who's ever summoned to visit him in the Oval Office and turns it down is an idiot. I don't care who it is. They're an idiot. I don't care what kind of, what kind of message they're trying to convey, what kind of statement they're... If the President of the United States sends me a personal invitation, I'm a coming. I'm a coming. Because that is a great honor. And just a few people ever, ever, ever get to go into the Oval Office and meet the President of the United States for just a few minutes. But I'm talking about one who is infinitely greater than the President. What would it take? What would it take? How hard would you have to fight to be able to see him and speak to him for just a few minutes? Lift your hands and praise him. Where, oh where, can such an extraordinary king be found? Where is his headquarters? How do you get there? Is it on some inaccessible mountaintop? Is it in an exclusive or secluded enclave somewhere? Do you have to go through all kinds of red tape to finally have your situation come before him? Oh, what a privilege it would be to finally stand in his presence and say, here is my situation, here is my need. Here is my problem. Here is my difficulty. Here is my infirmity. Because by the time you got there, you would know he has the power. He has the authority. I know he can do something about it. I know he can do something about it. It's reminiscent of a, of a centurion who said, I am a man under command. And I know what it's like to say to one come and to another go. And they do it. And so I know that all you've got to do is speak the word. And Jesus turns and said, I have not seen so great faith in all of Israel. Because somebody gets it. Somebody understands. I've got the power. I've got the ability. I've got the authority. Where's his headquarters, Brother Regan? Where can we find him? Where can we go? How can I buy a ticket? How can I get there? How can I travel to where he is at? Uh, I've come with some really good news for you tonight. Because this one that I'm talking about, who is unsurpassed in the scope of his power and authority and sovereignty, he is made the head of the body. The church. You are sitting in his headquarters tonight. While some of you are acting so casual and nonchalant, you are in the presence of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Jacob, running from his brother, had that dream. He had that dream of that great 
staircase that went all the way from heaven to the throne of God. And he got up the next morning and he named that place Bethel because he said this is the house of God, the gate of heaven. You can't see it here tonight, but there's a great staircase with angels ascending and descending, bearing petitions to the greatest sovereign this world has ever known. You can sit there like a knot in a log. You can sit there like you're at Walmart. Or you can realize he has the power. He has the ability. He has the answers. Come on, praise him, praise him, praise him. Praise him. You didn't just come to Racine camp meeting tonight. You came to the headquarters of this great potentate. This great Jesus Christ who is preeminent above all things. He can do all things, see all things, hear all things, change all things, fix all things, solve all things, heal every infirmity. Oh yes, he can. Oh yes, he can. That in all things, he might have the preeminence. Love him one more time, would you? Trying to hurry. You are where every need can be met. Beginning, I might say, with salvation. For in whom we have redemption by his blood. Let me tell you what this great sovereign was willing to do for you and me. Who were trapped in a sinful condition and could not deliver ourselves. And the devil was requiring a ransom that could not be paid in any other way and by any other means and by any other person. How do you, you can be seated if you want, how do you, how do you ransom an individual? You have to offer something of equal or greater value. Of equal or greater value. How do you ransom a soul? How do you ransom a soul? who is bound in the chains of sin and darkness and deliver them, amen, from the enemy who has them bound. You have to offer something of equal or greater value. That's why, amen, the blood of bulls and goats was never enough. It was not of equal value or surpassing value. But here comes Jesus, who again was not created. He was begotten. He was begotten by the Spirit of God that overshadowed Mary and gave birth to a baby who looked like a normal human being but who had a unique characteristic that no other human being possessed. His blood was untainted. His blood was untarnished by sin. The value of any currency is in direct proportion to its rarity and its exclusiveness. Gold is valuable, not just because it's beautiful, but because it's rare. Diamonds are valuable, not just because they are beautiful, but because they are rare. Dollars are worthless, amen. Praise the Lord. But the value of any currency is in direct proportion to its rarity to its rarity, its exclusivity, to its preciousness, to its preciousness. When the Bible uses the word precious, it's not just saying like somebody looks at a baby, oh, he's so precious. No, it's precious because it is rare. There's nothing else like it. That's why one drop of the blood of Jesus Christ 
is worth more than all the currency in all the world because there is nothing else there is nothing else there is nothing else like it anywhere there's never been another and there will never be another the blood of Jesus Christ was unique above the blood of anybody else because it had no stain of sin in it it was not Adam, Adamic blood it was not descendant from Adam it was pure it was holy one drop one drop is worth more than all the gold all the silver all the platinum mines all the rare diamonds and jewels one drop and this great sovereign loved you and I enough to say I'm going to come to earth and I'm going to pay the ransom and I'm going to use a currency that is equal and greater in value to all the souls that I'm going to redeem. We are redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Come on, praise him tonight. Y'all still with me tonight? Is this okay? I know this may be different than what you expected. Maybe you wanted me to preach issues or clothesline or whatever, and I'm not minimizing that. We'll do that some other, but today we're talking about Jesus. We're talking about Jesus, who is preeminent above all things. He who is preeminent above all things. And if he was willing to shed his blood for you, he's willing to do anything for you. There's salvation in his headquarters. There's deliverance in his headquarters. The Bible here says he delivered us from the power of darkness. This is a tremendous statement because this whole world lies in darkness and it's in the grip of demonic control, a network of evil and demonic power that is so organized and intricate and it has infiltrated every single segment of society from the halls of government down through, amen, the places of education and higher learning to the entertainment industry and all of technology and everything is infiltrated so that the people that are in the societies of this world are helplessly bound by the powers of darkness. They are helplessly bound by the powers of darkness. So much so that the devil does not want them to know what I'm preaching about here tonight. Because the Bible says if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded their minds. That's the light of this glorious gospel should shine unto them that they might be saved. But this great sovereign came to this earth and he implemented, implemented a plan of deliverance so that you could be set free from the power of darkness. And he hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. That word translated is a very important one. And it always makes me think of something that happened many years ago in 17, uh, 1976, actually, July 4th, 1976, a very dramatic event occurred. A couple days earlier, some Palestinian terrorists had hijacked an Air France airplane with 248 passengers and taken them to a country in Africa, uh, Uganda, and landed it at Entebbe. And at that time, it was under the control and rule of a very wicked dictator by the name of Idi Amin, who was sympathetic to the Palestinian cause and received them with open arms and put his soldiers at, at, at readiness uh, to protect them. 
But among these 248 passengers, since the airplane had actually left from Tel Aviv, Israel, and was on its way to Paris, France, on this airplane was 90-some Israelis. Israelis. And the Israelis, they have a different attitude toward things than most other people. And instead of wringing their hands, oh, what are we going to do? I guess it's just a big loss and we're helpless. And of course, uh, the terrorists were demanding that they would uh, set free a number of Palestinian prisoners that the Israelis and others were holding uh, in their prisons, uh, or they would begin to execute these Israelis one by one. But in the early morning hours of July 4th, 1976, several aircraft uh, with uh, almost a hundred commandos, Israeli commandos, landed at the airport in Entebbe. And they initiated an operation that was later called Operation Jonathan. Good name, great name. Praise the Lord. In honor of the one and only commando that was killed in that operation, who happened to be Jonathan Netanyahu, who is the, was the brother of the current uh, prime minister of Israel. And so the operation was named after him. In 90 minutes' time, they swarmed through there. They killed all the Ugandan guards that were uh, stationed around those hostages. They delivered all of the hostages. And in less than 90 minutes, they had all those Israelis on those planes heading out of there. They had translated them. Right out from the under the devil of the enemy's nose, translated them to freedom. And I always think about that when I read these when I read this scripture because it says, Who hath translated us from the power of darkness? Here you are living under the grip of a whole world that is locked in darkness. But this great sovereign, this great king, reached down and delivered you swoop down and set you free and the, and translated you out of the power of darkness into his kingdom into his kingdom this is where his headquarters is into his kingdom you know how he did it amen somebody came to you with a message it was an acts 238 message repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And everybody who hears that message and everybody who heeds that call and everybody who obeys that word is translated. I don't care if you're addicted to drugs tonight, he can set you free. I don't care if you're an alcoholic, he can set you free. I don't care what kind of a mess your life is in, this great king, this great potentate, this great sovereign has the power to deliver you from the power of darkness and translate you into his kingdom. So that someday very soon you can stand in congregations like this one and sing once like a bird in prison i dwelt no freedom from my sorrow i felt but jesus came and listened to me and glory to god he set me free he set me free has he set anybody free here tonight Come on, has he set anybody free here tonight? Come on, has he set anybody free here tonight? Here's the marvel of it. You didn't get like these Israelis swooped away and deposited back somewhere else you're still living where you always lived functioning where you always functioned where the devil had you bound the same street same workplace same environment but set free 
and the devil is growling and the devil is grinding his teeth and the devil is making all kinds of threats and no noises but it doesn't make no difference because I've been set free I'm walking around right under his nose but I've been set free some of y'all act like you haven't been some of y'all act like you need another deliverance come to church with a long face and a sad story whining and complaining devil's been after me all day bless his holy name chase me around every stump nearly caught me at each jump pray for me I'll survive I'll make it to the bitter end that's not the kind of deliverance I'm talking about there's some folks in this house who know who know who know my heart was distressed near Jehovah's dread frown and low in the pit where my sins dragged me down I cried to the Lord from the deep miry clay who tenderly brought me out to golden day he brought me out he brought me out and if the Lord saved me why should I be bad church again tonight oh man I'm so tired it's gonna be another boring Bible class oh I'm gonna have to fight sleep all the way through I don't know if I can take it tonight I'm so tired there's other folks that realize I'm going to the headquarters And the devil may have been chasing you all day. But sometimes it's like somebody, amen, who is playing baseball and they're rounding third base for home. And the ball has been caught in the outfield and it's been thrown to the infielder and now it's zinging its way, amen, to the guy at home base. But here you go and you slide your way in there and the umpire cries, Say! Sometimes that's the way we come to church with the devil hot in our heels, but we pull into the parking lot and the umpire says, Say! That's why we come in with a praise. We enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Thank God I made it one more time. He's going to hear my prayer. He's going to solve my problem. He's going to supply my need. He's going to heal my body. Because there's none bigger than him. There's none more powerful than him. Come on, everybody stay standing. Everybody stay standing. There's deliverance in this house. You can go home the way you came if you want to, but you're at heaven's headquarters tonight. You don't have to stand in the line thousands of miles long waiting for your case to be heard. You don't have to go through a sophisticated chain of command. You can whisper his name and he will hear you. He can solve your problems. He can supply your needs. Because he is preeminent. And he has all power. 
And he is a healer. And he can heal your body. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Angels ascending and descending. Angels ascending and descending. He's a healer. He's not just a healer of your body. He's a healer of your mind. There's people here tonight with deep emotional scars. People here tonight that have been carrying around pain and heartache for years. People, some of them who were secretly abused as children. And nobody knows. And nobody knows. Nobody knows. Oh, but it's crushing you every day. That's why you have a, such a hard time breaking through to victory. Emotional pain. People going through family problems. Heartache of marriage breakups. Children backsliding. Families being ripped apart. If you could just find the right counselor, if you could just connect with the right psychiatrist, if you could just go to the right clinic, if you could just find someone who would have that special knack to help you cope. You've come to the headquarters. He's the head of the body. The whole body derives its life from him, its strength from him. And he is the head of the church, and he is in this place. And while some are already in sandwich eating mode, and dessert eating mode, and fireworks mode, there's a few folks here tonight that just do not want to go back home the same way you came. And Christ, who is preeminent, who is above all things, through all things, in all things, created all things, in charge of all things, in control of all things, he has the solution to your problem right now. You just give me a few more minutes. And right here at the close of this service, there's not much room. I'm not even going to ask you to come to the front. Because, see, you're at headquarters. And when you speak to him, he hears you. And if someone who needs a special touch, a special healing in their body, will just maybe step out into the aisle close by where you are. Come on. Just step out into that aisle where you are. You don't have to come up here. Just step out in that aisle. Some of you are thinking, should I, shouldn't I? Then I'm not talking to you. I'm not preaching to you if you're still wondering if you ought to or not. Just forget everything I've said and ignore anything else I might say. Because if you're still deliberating, you haven't heard a word I said. But if you've come tonight thinking, oh, if I could just get help tonight. We don't have to say like Job said, oh, that I knew where I might find him. I go forward, go backward, I go right hand, left hand, 
Can't seem to find him anywhere. We don't have to ask that question. We've come to his headquarters. Mighty angels of God are standing at his beck and call. They are ascending and descending that stairway right now. And they can bear your petition right now. There's a lot of preachers in this house. If you're standing close to someone standing out in that aisle, would you just kind of move toward them and lay a hand on their shoulder? Would you do that? Come on, everybody. Everybody. If you're up here near the front and you're one of those needing help, just raise your hand. Indicate, I need prayer tonight. I need prayer. Come on. Oh, there ought to be such a clamor right now. There ought to be such a racket right now. There ought to be such a noise of prayer and supplication and entreaty. God Almighty, God Almighty. Come on, it might be a problem in your home, a problem in your family, a problem in your financial and material life. He is able, he is able, he is able. He is able. Oh, God. Come on, if you pray for one, find somebody else to pray with. You don't have to be a preacher. If there's somebody close to you and it's appropriate, lay a hand on their shoulder and pray for them right now. Come on, everybody. Everybody praying for one another.